Welcome to my podcast. I'm Arnie Sabatelli, and this is Hemingway Word for Word, in which I hope to offer episodes on many of Hemingway's short stories and novels. I will attempt to provide a complex analysis of his writing, pushing to consider ideas all too often neglected by traditional readings of his work. I will occasionally reference, critique, or debate with articles, films, books written about him. But mostly, these are my own ideas, distilled from many years of reading, writing about, and teaching Hemingway to college and high school students. Before settling in, I recommend reading or rereading the work at hand and having a copy of the text with you as you listen. I hope you've been enjoying these episodes and will consider making a small contribution to assist me financially as I devote many hours of my time to writing, recording, and editing with minimal commercial advertising or interruptions. You can find a link to contribute at anchor.fm forward slash Arnold hyphen Sabatelli spelled S-A-B-A-T-E-L-L-I. Then just click on the support tab and follow the instructions. Your support will be greatly appreciated. For my first podcast of 2023, with much of the country under a heavy blanket of snow and winter firmly upon us, cross-country snow from in our time seemed like a good way to begin the new year. The story is, again, quite short, and I'll often offer up this story as a suggestion for people to read if they think that Hemingway, as a good modernist, only writes stories and novels filled with bleakness, violence, and despair. I see this story as flashing forward to a future more mature and grounded Nick, who has wholly committed himself to becoming a writer and a father. It injects a positive, hopeful energy to the collection as we approach the final two-part story, Big Two-Hearted River, and it is critical in understanding Nick Adams' development as a character. So, to get the most out of the podcast, take a few minutes now and read or reread the short story, Cross Country Snow. The story begins mid-action, with dizzying, breathless descriptions of Nick leaping from a funicular train car and descending down a Swiss mountain with his good friend, yet another character named George. The train car has come as far as it possibly could up the mountain, heavy drifted snow preventing it from moving forward as Nick finishes up waxing his skis in the baggage car and proceeds to clamp his feet tight, there's that word again, into his skis and jumps sideways out into the snow. Quote, he jumped from the car sideways onto the hard windboard, made a jump turn, and crouching and trailing his sticks slipped in a rush down the slope. These early sentences themselves rush along, the words falling forward. Here again, the words themselves echo the action at hand, a lot like the woman's from Cat in the Rain's description of the sea that, quote, broke in a long line in the rain to come up and break again in a long line in the rain. Note all the repeating words in these early sentences. The word snow, for instance, appears more than a dozen times in the first page alone. The word down, nine or ten times. In the first three sentences, we find, not surprisingly, a short chiasmus. As I've mentioned before, a chiasmus is a specific form of poetic repetition the exact words appearing as ABC, then CBA, folding in and then out again, with no limitation on how many repeating words there can be. You could have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then G, F, E, D, C, B, A, for instance. Here we find the words car, snow, then snow, car, in the first few lines of the story. And a careful scan shows a range of short overlapping chiasmuses in these opening lines. Windboard, car, car, windboard, snow, down, down, snow, snow, ski, ski, snow. And under closer examination, I'm sure there are more and longer ones, especially if you allow synonyms like crouching and kneeling, where we find kneeling, trailing, trailing, crouching. Suffice it to say that, yet again, we find a tightly organized pattern structure to Hemingway's repetitions, which, in a painterly way, gets our eyes to moving as a painting might set them in motion. The experience is both visual and abstract. The last part of that last sentence of the first paragraph is particularly interesting. The sentence reads, 
he jumped from the car sideways onto the hard windboard, comma, made a jump turn, and crouching and trailing, his sticks slipped in a rush down the slope. As there's just one comma, the verb slipped almost seems to belong with the word sticks. But reading back through the sentence, we can see that the noun he, from he jumped, is the thing that is slipping. The words crouching and trailing also feel as if they could both belong with he, though trailing makes more sense when attached to the sticks, the ski poles. So the flexibility of these verbs to nearly attach themselves to other nouns in the sentence intensifies the action of Nick suddenly rushing out into the gale that is scouring the exposed surface of the mountain, magnifying the exhilarating rush of action of the opening pages of the story. Let me just read the next few paragraphs aloud by way of underscoring the rush of words designed to help us experience the rush of emotion Nick is feeling. On the white below, George dipped and rose and dipped out of sight. The rush and the sudden swoop as he dropped down a steep undulation in the mountainside plucked Nick's mind out and left him only the wonderful flying, dropping sensation in his body. He rose to a slight uprun, and then the snow seemed to drop out from under him as he went down, down, faster and faster in a rush down the last long steep slope. Crouching so he was almost sitting back on his skis, trying to keep the center of gravity low, the snow driving like a sandstorm, he knew the pace was too much, but he held it, he would not let go and spill. Then a patch of snow, left in a hollow by the wind, spilled him and he went over and over in a clashing of skis, feeling like a shot rabbit, then stuck his legs crossed, his skis sticking straight up, and his nose and ears jammed full of snow. And a little further down, Nick Adams came up past George, big back and blonde head, still faintly snowy, then his skis started slipping at the edge as he swooped down in the crystalline powder snow and seeming to float up and drop down as he went up and down the billowing coulds. He held to his left and at the end as he rushed toward the fence, keeping his knees locked tight together and turning his body like tightening a screw, brought his skis sharply around to the right in a smother of snow and slowed into a loss of speed parallel to the hillside and the wire fence. He looked up the hill. George was coming down in telemark position, kneeling, one leg forward and bent, the other trailing, his sticks hanging like some insect's thin legs kicking up puffs of snow as they touched the surface, and finally the whole kneeling, trailing figure coming around in a beautiful right curve, crouching, the legs shot forward and back, the body leaning out against the swing, the sticks accenting the curve like points of light, all in a wild cloud of snow. I'm certain I didn't do justice to what I sense whenever I read these opening pages. How the words take us for our own ride, down, down, up, down again, through all the snow, all the actual word snow, into the joyful, exhilarating emotions at the beginning of the story. In the description of George's telemark, we find two semicolons placed ungrammatically after the words kneeling and trailing. Quote, George was coming down in telemark position, kneeling, semicolon one leg forward and bent, the other trailing, semicolon, his sticks hanging like some insect's thin legs. Those semicolons feel like ski pole plants themselves. The sentence is pivoting on these punctuation marks, slowing us down a little before the next rush, the next turn of phrase, comes again. And then we find that wonderful simile, like some insect's thin legs. Especially if you've ever seen anyone telemark ski, the way you have to hold your hands out far from your body to keep your balance. It is insect-like, to be sure. Here again, we find a subtle and not so subtle point of view. While it's not overtly given as Nick's, a careful reading reveals that everything in these opening passages is firmly grounded in him. And as in other stories, the rhythmic sentences, the two similes, the chiasmuses, suggest a perspective grounded in artistic expression a perspective that wants to get the words just right, that works to capture the experience of the emotion fully with language that parallels and accentuates the actual lived sensations. George tells Nick that he, quote, made a beauty to describe his Christie, 
short for a stem Christie turn, I assume. And if Nick is the one making the story, in a sense, then that's striking praise and acknowledgement. He, Hemingway through Nick, is making a beauty here with his words, with the turns and twists and momentum of the language. Early on, we also witnessed Nick finding a way to make do despite his bad knee, likely a war injury, an acceptance of his own limitations that he can't telemark anymore. Throughout the story, Nick comes across as confident but self-effacing, kind, generous, giving. Notice how early on he even lifts the barbed wire fence so George can pass. Notice that these opening descriptions show us Nick and George having a lot of fun as they ski down the mountain. All the kinetic, nearly out of control motion and momentum of their actions brings to mind the woman in Cat in the Rain saying, quote, it's no fun to be a poor kitty out in the rain. And Nick and George's skiing fun clearly stands at the opposite end of the spectrum of that poor kitty, also crouched, but not moving, stationary, cowering, like the woman herself stranded in that hotel room with her unresponsive husband, George, for company. I think, too, of that word fun from the end of something, where Nick ends his relationship with Marjorie for the vague reason that it, quote, isn't fun anymore, not any of it. And then Marjorie's famous, isn't love any fun, and Nick's, no. Which, as I've covered before, becomes a kind of admission of his growing love for Marjorie. Love isn't just fun and games. It's more than that, deeper, more complex, more significant. And as we will soon discover, the fun of this story will also be coming to an end as well but under strikingly different circumstances. And Nick here fashions a very different response to the end of this fun. From the outset, Cross Country Snow feels familiar, almost at times as if it's a rewrite or a new iteration of stories we've already read, especially stories with Nick Adams in them. Just as Nick comes to the Indian cabin in the woods in Indian camp, or to Bugs and adds his fire in the midst of the forest in the Battler, here his journey also brings him to a place of refuge in a forest. We find an exact repetition of Indian camp with the words, inside it was quite dark. And inside this dark structure, Nick also encounters a pregnant woman, just as in Indian camp. But unlike coming here against his will in the cold, misty darkness with his father's arms wrapped around him, he has come here willingly. We find another striking contrast with the battler here as well. In this story, he was not thrown off the train by a violent brakeman, but rather he has leapt willingly forth from another train that has come to a stop into the gales of the high mountainside. Also, unlike the darkness and eerie sameness of the landscape on both sides of the track in the Tamarack Swamp, of the battler, here all is white and in furious motion, that gray, dim, haunting, still, and terrifying mist, replaced with joyful, bright, ecstatic movement and energy. Like all the stories in In Our Time, cross-country snow echoes and repeats and gathers up and pushes forward so much of the imagery that has preceded it, and also lays the groundwork for imagery to come, especially what we will soon see in Big Two-Hearted River. As Nick and George approach the tavern at the side of the mountain road they have skied down to, I'm struck with the way Nick describes things. First we find, quote, through the woods they could see a long, low-eaved, weather-beaten building. Then, quote, through the trees it was faded yellow. And after that, quote, closer the window frames were painted green. And finally, quote, the paint was peeling. We move from through the woods to through the trees as they approach, moving from looking at the structure that can only be discerned as low-eaved and weather-beaten, no colors mentioned yet, to one that is, quote, faded yellow. Then as Nick gets closer, being able to discern that its window panes were painted a different color, green, something unseeable from far away. And finally, when standing right alongside it, standing on the porch, Nick can see that that paint was peeling. The steady refinement of details as Nick approaches again feels to me as if Nick is 
testing himself in a way or practicing paying extremely close attention to what he can see from different distances. He's working hard to notice what he notices and paying close attention to how that perception shifts and changes from different vantage points, something that began with the wonderful descriptions of the skiing. And this again is a painterly observation, echoing the woman of Cat in the Rain's descriptions of the painters who came to take careful notice of the Italian town by the sea in order to paint them. It feels to me as if Nick is asking himself, what can I see from here? And now, how does it appear differently from here? And now that I'm right alongside the tavern, what more can I notice? Testing himself as a writer, as an artist. Nick continues to pay close attention to all the details once they've removed their skis, noting that he has to, quote, kick his heels into the icy footing and that he can hear, quote, George's breathing and kicking in his heels just behind him. Once inside, Nick continues working self-consciously to notice things closely. He notes the, quote, smooth benches and the, quote, wine-stained tables, and that the stove is porcelain, that the ceiling is low, that a voice in the next room stopped singing, and the girl's apron, the one who is singing, is blue. From the first lines of the story, Nick is on high alert, self-consciously paying very close attention to everything. Soon they order wine, George letting Nick, the more knowledgeable one when it comes to wine, pick one, just as when they start talking to each other, Hemingway emphasizes and establishes Nick as the more mature, more experienced character in the story. And as he did in Hills Like White Elephants, when the girl repeats the title of the story and takes note of the exact same things the unnamed narrative perspective looked to in the opening lines, Nick here says, quote, There's nothing really can touch skiing, is there? The way it feels when you first drop off on a long run. For me, these words underscore that we have been deeply inside of Nick's point of view all along in the opening descriptions, feeling his joy and wonder, his thrill of rushing down a mountain strapped tightly into his skis. And George's reply here is telling, quote, It's too swell to talk about. In other words, the emotion of it is so great, it's so difficult to capture in words to, quote, talk about. And yet, precisely what we have read in the opening scenes manages to talk about it, to use words, to say something important about it, to capture it. And Nick is the one who has done this, who has found a way to use words to capture that which is so hard to express, finding a way to somehow do it, which is the job of a good writer. After settling in, the girl brings in the wine, but they have, quote, trouble with the cork. When, quote, Nick finally opened it, he says, quote, those specks of cork in it don't matter. Here I find several really striking echoes with Indian camp. Remember in that story, Nick's father, the doctor, describes the baby as making a lot of, quote, trouble for everyone because he was breached, and hence the difficulty in getting the baby out, the need for surgery, here Nick is having trouble with a cork, trouble getting it out, and doing a kind of surgery on it to get to the wine. Remember, too, how Nick's father says he doesn't hear her screams because they are not important, which bears a striking resemblance to Nick's, quote, those specks of cork in it don't matter. They're not important. It almost feels as if Nick Hemingway is working consciously or subconsciously to reenact that dark, poignant moment in Nick's childhood recasting it, remembering that first time he felt and implemented the power of artistic expression to move beyond the limitations of science and animus-based knowledge when he looked to the circle of the bass jumping, put his hand in the warm water to manage to encompass or say or express that which is hard to talk about or to say it using logic alone. When, quote, the girl came back in, Nick is struck that he, quote, noticed her apron covered swellingly her pregnancy, thinking, quote, I wonder why I didn't see that when she first came in, he thought. In this rare moment of moving overtly and directly into a character's thoughts, Hemingway emphasizes Nick's disappointment in himself for not noticing this especially as we are about to discover that his own wife, girlfriend, Helen, is herself pregnant, that he will soon be a father. 
Notice Nick doesn't think, quote, I should have noticed that, but rather he asks himself why he didn't see that when he first came in. He had even noted that her apron was blue, the thing that covered her pregnancy. It's as if Nick examines his own character here, acknowledging and then investigating his own inability to see something that should have been so obvious, especially to him, a man with a pregnant wife or girlfriend. In the dialogue to come with George, we do get a sense that Nick was not totally happy about the pregnancy at one point early on. Are you glad, George asks, about the baby? And Nick answers, yes, now, clearly suggesting that at some point he was not happy. I think Nick's wondering why he hadn't noticed the pregnant waitress could have a lot to do with his own emotional responses to the coming birth of his child. And he's aware of that. And his wondering why suggests that he's investigating his own emotional responses as an artist, especially as a writer who hopes to imagine and create believable and complex characters. A good writer will investigate such things, will wonder why their characters act in certain ways and what motivates them. Immediately after we get this glimpse of Nick's thinking, Nick works to compensate for his potential failings as someone who should have noticed the girl's pregnancy with an almost Sherlock Holmes-like exchange with George, where he defends the, quote, touchy waitress based on his acute perceptions, quote, she's from up where they speak German probably, and she's touchy about being here, and then she's got that baby coming without being married, and she's touchy. George, playing Dr. Watson, asks, how do you know she isn't married? And Nick replies, no ring, proving to George and perhaps to himself that he has gone a step beyond noticing details to noticing the absence of certain details, the absence of a ring here, using this observation to speculate about what motivates her. Again, a good writer needs to think about their characters in this way. I also find it striking here that Nick is so deeply empathetic with the girl, in contrast to the less mature George. Deep empathy is one of the first things psychologists look to when assessing one's maturity and sanity, and here Nick surely demonstrates that, rather than being annoyed with the waitress, as George is, he looks past this to figure out what might make her so touchy. This is an essential trait of good fiction writers. As Flannery O'Connor, another great American storyteller, said, a writer should not, quote, judge their characters. You should not write about them, but with them. Just as Nick wonders why he hadn't noticed this girl's pregnancy, exploring his own motivations and flaws, here he works to unravel what motivates her. And after his Holmes-like revelations to George, it's as if Nick further practices his writing ability to describe, to paint for us, the woodcutters who have just come in, quote, stamping their boots, steaming, how they sat, quote, smoking and quiet with their hats off, leaning back against the wall or forward on the table. Nick then turns to the sensations of sounds, noting that the, quote, horses on the wood sledges made an occasional sharp jangle of bells as they tossed their heads, here again filling in the details from something not seen but only heard, the shaking of their heads. Nick lingers here on how happy he and George are, how fond they are of each other, and George's observation that the wine makes him feel, quote, good but funny, serves as a kind of metaphorical model for Nick's later, yes, now, when George asks him if he's happy about Helen's pregnancy. It also emphasizes how Nick is noticing, understanding, and working to express emotions that are like the act of skiing, hard to write about, hard to fashion into language. What they are experiencing is just like the wine, quote, good but funny, in that it's not some one emotion, not something you can say easily with a single word. It requires, like the woman's response to the padrone and a cat in the rain, the entirety of the work of art to start to unravel it. Remember, the padrone made her feel both small and supremely important somehow, a paradoxical emotion. Hemingway finally turns toward filling in some of the backstory at play here. We find out George is leaving the next day to, quote, get educated, that they won't be able to ski like this again anytime soon. And then we discover Nick's own backstory that motivates and drives the whole central emotion of this story. Just as Hemingway leaves out any mention of the operation in Hills Like White Elephants, 
until other imagery has already steered us in that direction, and how in the end of something, the mini-story of the logging history of Horton's Bay echoes and intensifies the breakup story of Nick and Marjorie to come, here too, Hemingway waits to reveal what lies at the emotional center of this story, that Nick's wife or girlfriend is pregnant, that they will be leaving Europe soon so she can have the baby in the States. As these revelations are made, one thing I find particularly fascinating is how Nick and George's dialogue feels like yet another version of Nick and Marjorie's dialogue in the end of something, or even Nick and Ad's dialogue in The Battler. Here again, we find repetition of words like no, K-N-O-W, and no, N-O, and yes, and I don't know, and I do know, etc. These repetitions, as in the earlier stories, suggest that more is being said beneath the surface. Let me just read first some of Nick and George's dialogue to you and listen for these repetitions. Wine always makes me feel this way, he said. Feel bad, Nick said. No, I feel good but funny. I know, Nick said. Sure, said George. Should we have another bottle, Nick asked. Not for me, George said. They sat there, Nick leaning his elbows on the table. George slumped back against the wall. Is Helen going to have a baby, George said, coming down to the table from the wall. Yes. When? Late next summer. Are you glad? Yes. Now. Will you go back to the States? I guess so. Do you want to? No. Does Helen? No. George sat silent. He looked at the empty bottle and the empty glasses. It's hell, isn't it? He said. No. Not exactly, Nick said. Why not? I don't know, Nick said. Will you ever go skiing together in the States? George said. I don't know, said Nick. The mountains aren't much, George said. No, said Nick. They're too rocky. There's too much timber. And they're too far away. Yes, said George. That's the way it is in California. Yes, Nick said. That's the way it is everywhere I've ever been. Yes, said George. That's the way it is. Some things to pay attention to here. The exchange begins with Nick's acknowledgement of what George says about the wine that makes him feel good but funny. But when George first says wine makes him feel this way, Nick asks for clarification. Do you feel bad? And George says, no, good but funny. To which Nick replies, I know, K-N-O-W. So right away in the exchange, we find Nick seeking to better understand George's feelings and then verifying with him his own assertion, I know. Notice also how the N-O and yes responses, no and yes responses, repeat and give structure to the exchange. Those three no's, those three N-O's in the center of the dialogue act as a kind of pivot. And we can find a very simple chiasmus here. Yes, yes, no, 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 yes, yes. With a third yes as a kind of way to push the emotion towards something more positive. Anyway, here we cannot help but think of Nick and Ads, or Nick and Marjorie. In The Battler, we find this dialogue. Ads beginning, No, I'm not. I'm crazy. Listen, you ever been crazy? No, Nick said. How does it get you? I don't know, Ads said. When you got it, you don't know about it. You know me, don't you? No. I'm Ad Francis. Honest to God? Don't you believe it? Yes. Nick knew it must be true. Do you know how I beat them? No. Think, too, of Nick and Marjorie in the end of something. Nick begins, there's going to be a moon tonight. I know it, Marjorie said happily. You know everything. You know everything. That's the trouble. There's that word trouble. You know you do. Marjorie did not say anything. You know you do. What don't you know anyway? I don't know. Of course you know. No, I don't. It isn't fun anymore, not any of it. She didn't say anything. He went on. I feel as though everything was gone to hell inside of me. I don't know, Marge. I don't know what to say. He looked at her back. Isn't love any fun, Marjorie said. No, Nick said. All these K-N-O no's and N-O no's and yeses, all these assertions of having knowledge or of something or not having knowledge. As Nick says, he knows what George means when he says the wine makes him feel good but funny. Or an admission of a lack of knowledge as in, I don't know, 
when Nick admits he doesn't know why it isn't hell to have to leave Europe to have a baby, have been seen before. And I think Hemingway is inviting us to look at this story, this exchange in direct correlation with these past two exchanges that I just read. They're remarkably similar. I also love the way George's good but funny description of how the wine makes him feel, in a sense, morphs into Nick's yes now in response to whether he's happy about the baby. Good but funny, yes now. And then it morphs again a few lines later into his even more complex expression, no, not exactly, as a reply to George's, it's hell, isn't it? And note here another similarity with the end of something where Nick feels as if everything has gone to hell inside of him. And as I was reading that passage, I saw that the word trouble is there again, um, like the word trouble in Indian camp and the word trouble here about the cork. Nick is becoming increasingly aware in this story of an emotion that, like the skiing, is hard to talk about, that, like the feeling the wine gives them, is a multitude of things all at once. Leaving the fun of Europe with its remarkable skiing and cheap, wonderful wine and delicious strudel is not exactly hell. George investigates Nick now. Why not? To which Nick replies, I don't know echoing his earlier I know confirmation about how the wine makes him feel, even as he echoes his earlier self from Three Day Blow and The Battler and the woman at the end of Cat in the Rain emphatically announcing she doesn't know why she wanted the cat so badly. For both Nick and the woman, while they don't understand the why as a logical explanation of the emotion, they still do know with an emotional or artistic certainty why. Notice also that George's why here echoes Nick's own I wonder why I didn't see that when she first came in. George then asks a more manageable question. Will you ever go skiing together in the States? To which Nick also answers, quote, I don't know. Though this I don't know is much simpler, more grounded, and when we find three yeses, first George's agreement about skiing in the States as too rocky, too much timber, too far away. Yes, that's the way it is in California. And Nick's yes, followed by that's the way it is everywhere I've ever been. And finally, George's yes, that's the way it is. In this exchange, Nick, like the woman in Hills Like White Elephants, turns these seemingly mundane expressions into something much more metaphorical. His, that's the way it is everywhere I've ever been, is noticeably different than George's, that's the way it is. And this says something very different. George's expression says something much simpler and more logical, something less than what Nick is trying to give voice to. Nick continues speaking more and more emphatically as the dialogue concludes, reminding me of the woman's demands at the end of Cat in the Rain. I want a cat, I want a cat. I want a cat now, she says. When he says, we've got to, as a response to whether they'll ever go skiing together again, he has the same kind of urgency. He adds that, quote, it isn't worthwhile if you can't. Here again, he senses he's saying something more, something far richer, just as when the woman notes the coloration of the skin of the hills through the trees in Hills Like White Elephants. Nick here is working to use metaphorical expressiveness as a tool to begin to say what can't be talked about. The story ends quietly, simply noting, quote, now they would have the run home together. Nick acknowledging that for now they have this fun, physically enjoyable thing to do, that now also acknowledging a future time when other much more complex events will transpire things less fun than this, but which are also okay. Here we find Nick from the end of something deeply changed, willing to let the fun end, willing to love deeply, even if it isn't fun in that simple ski down a mountain sense, to move from the firm footing of dry land into the denser, more difficult to navigate element of water, to go from the shallows to the depths using the imagery from that story. He's thrilled by the fun of skiing for its rush and intensity, but I think he's also thrilled by the prospect of becoming a father, 
by the more complex emotional rush of what he is on the cusp of experiencing, of dropping off and down into. Both things are important. His, it's not worth it if they don't ski again, shows that that essential aspect of being human has to do with taking visceral joy from what our senses take in, the rush of skiing, the taste of good wine, the warmth of a porcelain stove. But he is also about to experience the mystery of creating life, becoming a father, raising a child, loving someone deeply, what he was on the verge of doing at one point with Marjorie. The Nick Adams of cross-country snow is the most mature, most balanced, most complete and whole version of him that we'll find in the collection. Though Big Too Hard River is placed after this story, we will find that the Nick there is taking steps toward, but has not fully realized yet, the Nick Adams we find in Cross Country Snow. The Nick of this story is clearly working to become a good writer, is investigative of characters he encounters and of himself. He is, like the woman of Cat in the Rain, artistically alert, pushing to unearth and express the complexities of human experience. Some final thoughts. Students ask me if I think this is the same George from A Cat in the Rain. They also wonder why Hemingway named Nick's uncle, Uncle George, in Indian camp. Can he come up with more names? Students jokingly wonder. I've come up with a few responses to these questions. First, the three Georges of In Our Time are all Georges, perhaps, since they do share certain attributes. All three of them look at the world simply, literally, or at least in a manner that is much less complex than the Nick of Indian Camp, or of the end of something, or the Nick in The Battler even, and certainly the Nick in this story. And the George of Cat in the Rain, who barely speaks and doesn't move from the bed, is certainly less engaged and interesting than his wife, or Nick. Secondly, the repetition of the name George is an artistically forceful way to get us to consider these three stories together, to consider other things they have in common, more complex things, things more difficult to say, like Nick's I don't know when asked why having a pregnant wife and needing to leave Europe so she can have the baby in the States isn't hell exactly. The story also stands as a kind of bookend to Hills Like White Elephants, which comes in Hemingway's next collection, Men Without Women. Here we see a man who is okay now with having a child. Perhaps he was more like the man in Hills when he first found out. But Nick's behavior in this story, especially his deep empathy for their pregnant waitress, however, reveals someone fundamentally different than the man in Hills, I would argue. Not only does Nick want Helen to have the baby, he is willing to give up the wonderful life they have in Europe for the good of the child. And that sacrifice isn't hell, as George suggests. Far from it. Yet another similarity to Hills Like White Elephants is that Hemingway uses pregnancy in both stories as a metaphor for artistic expression. Everything in this story feels pregnant, filled with meaning, and Nick uses the things he draws for us with words as tools with which to give voice to things that can only be expressed with creative, metaphorical language. Cross Country Snow shows us a mature, empathetic Nick Adams, intent to become a writer and also ready to accept the challenges of fatherhood. Like Hemingway, we find Nick embracing both a love of felt, experiential, simple fun, and the more nuanced and valuable things he's about to encounter as a parent and as a writer. If you're enjoying Hemingway word for word, I hope you'll consider showing your support by making a small financial contribution to the show. Go to anchor.fm forward slash Arnold hyphen Sabatelli S-A-B-A-T-E-L-L-I and click on the support link to see how you can contribute. For my next podcast, I'll go back to the story Soldier's Home, which I think will be essential in terms of understanding the later story, Big Two-Hearted River, at the end of the collection. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>